Great. So I can't, I, I've just realized this is my first experience doing one of these Zoom kind of things. So Spella, I can see you. I can't see anyone else. Um, you won't see anyone else. Okay. I won't see anyone else. So you can see it. So Spella, I will ask you, you can see and hear me? Yes. Excellent. So I'm going to assume that everyone else can. If they, if anyone can do anything like thumbs up in the chat, I don't know if they can do that or not. Hopefully so. Ah, brilliant. Yay. Okay. Okay. Yay. Okay. Well, <laughs> we well, have an audience, Jen. And, and people can seem to uh, use the um, use the uh, use the chat function, which is fantastic. So just as people are coming in for the next like thirty seconds or so, um, if you'd like to just say you know your name or put in the chat, I should say your name, where you're from, and what your favorite outdoor spot is. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I would say that, uh, I'm Jen DeWitt and I am a, um, researcher along with Spella, um, at, in the STEM participation and social justice group at the Institute of Education. Um, and at, or I should say at IOE, which is UCL's faculty of education and society, because there has been a rebranding, which we don't fully understand. Um, in terms of my favorite outdoor spots, oh, I, I, there, there are many, it can be, it can be very hard to um, sort of imagine, but I would almost say most places that have a, a sort of beach when the fog is kind of rolling in, there was, um, sort of overlooking kind of a beachy sandy beachy spot um on uh or off the coast of cape cod uh in the u.s and just when the fog would roll in there i think that's probably probably mine um uh spella how about you Not well i'm just sure. putting it in that in in a chat ah, okay. um, so hi i'm i'm spella i'm a uh, researcher at ucl working with um uh, Jen, I'll say a bit more about the project and where this framework that we'll be talking about today has come from. Um, I was going to put that my favorite uh, spot is Bushy Park, which um, is five minutes from where I live, and I just love it. It's very tranquil and, and, and just such a great calm space to be able to go to um, close to home. Fantastic. And um, just also, uh, so yeah, so I will go ahead and start the session more officially. This is on the equity compass. So if you are, if that is not what you were expecting, perhaps you're in the wrong room, but you are very, very welcome regardless. Um, and the equity compass is a tool that was developed as part of the youth equity and STEM project. And it was developed for practitioners to use to sort of guide them on their paths, kind of in the same way that a, that a compass may guide you on your path. I see fellas uh, sharing the screen towards more equitable practice. Um, so there's the diagram of the uh, of the equity compass there. So and finally, for those who are just coming in um, now, people are introducing themselves in terms of where they're from and what their favorite outdoor spot is um, or outside spot is. And seeing some lovely, lovely places. Ah, places with mountains, hills, water, and trees, and no cars. That sounds fantastic um, to me as well. So anyway, so so just to um, go ahead and get started, we in, in the um, in the project and in dealing with this sort of work around equity spell. Can you go to the next slide? Um, there is a lot of terminology that gets used. And so this sort of provides you with a bit of background to the project overall in, or to our work overall, I should say, really, which this project is, is a part. And in the, um, the uh, STEM participation and social justice group, we're obviously very much leaning towards supporting social justice, and that informs a lot of, or all of the work really that we do and the approaches that we take in our research. And not surprisingly, because researchers love terminology, we have those, there are various terms that get used, many of which are familiar, but get sort of defined in different ways. So just to sort of establish or give you a little bit of background of how we're using these terms in our work, equality basically involves treating everyone the same. So as you see in the picture, we have the three kids, each of whom get a box that's the same size to help them see over the fence. And it's more helpful for some of them than others. 
in an approach that's based more on equity, it really involves differentiating and trying to support people in different ways, depending on what their particular needs and situation are. So giving more to those who need more or perhaps are more disadvantaged. So there the, you see the shorter um, ballerina on the right has three boxes to help her see over the fence. Um, whereas the boy on the or no, the ballerina on the left and the boy on the right has, has just the one box because he's a bit taller. So the approach, again, that we really take is, as I said, more of a social justice type approach. And it's really involving not just giving people what they need to help them get over the barrier, but to really try to take down some of these barriers and challenge these barriers and try to make changes in your practice and, and in life generally to try to do things in this that can take down some of these barriers to try to challenge some of these things that create and maintain in inequality. So in the, the picture there to just take down that fence. And so that's really kind of the, the background to our work um, focused around, around equity and social justice. Um, next slide, please. So we'd like to start with really a bit of re reflection and um, loving the, the outdoor spots. But what we'd like to do now is to really don't type anything for a minute, but just reflect for about a minute on why you feel equity is important to you in your work, why you're embarking on this path, why you want to, to go down this route towards more equitable practice, um, and to just take a moment to kind of reflect on that. And then in about 30 seconds, you can go ahead and type them in your chat in the chat, but we're going to waterfall this. So that means type it in, but don't press the button to hit send until I say go. So I'm just going to give it about um, about 20 more seconds for people to, to type things in, but don't hit go or don't hit uh, submit, I think is the, whatever it is that you, um, the, the or return or whatever. I was just trying to test to see what that button is, but three, two, one, go. Oh goodness, I didn't expect that noise to come. <laughs> Yeah, so I really like, for example, um, oh, now it's disappeared because that's the, that's the downside to waterfalling. You can't always see it all at once. But um, Ruth's comment about, for example, national parks are for everyone, but they're not really at the moment. And it's what makes us hum human and it's sort of a core principle and better for everything and the right thing to do, I think, in, in many ways. Um, and being aware, exactly, I really like um, Peter's point about being aware of our own privilege and reflecting on that and being reflexive about how that can um, put us in a position to in, in, put us in a particular position in this work. And then again, and um, it's Chiara has pointed out about these um, health inequalities as well, for example, that are connected to to race. So there's there's a lot of different ways that this can inform our work and and thinking about no, and I love Alice's point about um, improving the quality, accuracy and outcomes of, of our research. So it can be important in a range of, of different ways. And hopefully then, even though we, we practice in different areas and we're approaching different things, the equity compass can be helpful in that. So moving on to, again, you can see our efforts to also make this session relatively um, interactive. And we'd like to hear about the uh, next slide, please, Stella, about where you feel you are on your journey towards more equitable practice. So we've got a poll that Stu um, from Communicate, who's sort of helping organize this conference, has um, set up for us. So hopefully, Stu, can you launch that? My understanding. Ah, yes, there we go. So on this scale from zero to 10 or one to 10, with zero or even one, let's say, being just starting out and beginning to think about this, kind of curious about it, and 10 being feeling like equity is really embedded in everything you do. And so I think what happens is after people sort of click and have a chance to vote, then um, Stu can kind of display the, uh, the answers. Okay, Stu, if you've got, let's see, it looks like, ah, excellent. So definitely people are at a range of, um, 
at a range of places along their journey. I think that's that's fantastic. And, and people are really working towards, I would say, if I had to summarize, because somewhere back in my in my head, I'm also kind of a quants person, that people are, are really starting to work towards embedding it, that have some experience, certainly are curious, interested in, and starting to try to incorporate this um, in our practice, which is fantastic. So I think if I can, or yes, Stu has closed that. And so now I'll really hand over to Spella to really talk a bit more about um, the equity compass and to really dive into that. And then at the end, we'll have some, some more time for um, some Q and A. Thank you, Jen. Um, so I'm, I'm Spella and I'll, uh, I'll go to the next couple of slides um, overviewing what is the equity compass. Uh, Jen already briefly mentioned, it's a research-based um, framework that can support critical reflective practice and thinking and developing equitable ways of working. And we know there's a lot of commitment to equity and inclusion. There's increasing awareness that a lot of spaces, programs, opportunities are not as equitable as they could be. But we find it's often less clear about how to go about achieving more um, equitable practice. So um, the equity compass framework can help us consider different dimensions of, of equity that are in social justice that are useful to think about, helps us ask um, reflective questions for those dimensions. Um, and it can help us both identify strong aspects of the work, things that we're already doing well, but also things that we can, we can further improve and kind of track where we are um, on the journey. And um, who, who might use the equity compass? Um, over the past years, the tool has um, been adopted by different professionals in different sectors. Um, it was initially um, developed and used in the informal science learning um, space. So like from museums to zoos, um, hackathons, uh, community centers doing, doing STEM, um, but has later been taken out by uh, teachers, school leaders, other public engagement professionals, as well as policymakers and funders. Um, and, and there's one example that I post, I, I put a, image on to the right, um, British Science Association has, has used this to think about and develop that audience-led work, like how to be more participatory. So we think it, it, it's, it can really be used by um, different people thinking about um, equitable work. Before I go into the details of, of the different dimensions, uh, just a few words about how the compass was developed. And I want to emphasize this was very much a collective effort by a team of practitioners and researchers working together on a five-year uh, partnership called Youth Equity and, and STEM. It was a UK-US uh, collaboration. And we didn't initially set out to develop this framework, but we were focused on identifying, understanding, and supporting equitable practice. And it became clear as we were going through, through our project that um, the ideas were often quite, quite fuzzy, and, and it was difficult always to articulate what it was that we mean with equitable practice. So having a more structured approach and a shared understanding was really helpful for our project. And then we found it was very helpful for other professionals as well, which kind of led us to develop um, versions and adaptations for, for other people as well. So what I'll do now is go through the main areas of the compass. And I'd really like to encourage you to think about how they might relate to the work that you do. I understand, you know, you might, you might have quite different roles um, in, in your job. So some questions may not be directly relevant, but see if, if there's like a, an adaptation of the question or like how, how you could think about a particular angle in, in your project at the moment, your organization, your, your role. Um, I also want to highlight, if you do have any questions, um, do pop them uh, in the Q&A 
part of the um, of the platform and and we'll have a few minutes at least at the end to try and address them or we can address them after after this session um, and i also wanted to highlight this would be quite a quick taste of what the framework is so given how much time we've got in this session we'll go to some of the ideas quite quickly but if this is something that resonates with you and you want to um, go in deeper we'll, we'll um I signpost you to where other resources are. We also have an, an online course about how to use the, the framework if they might be of, of interest. And we put some um, um, social media and websites in, in the corner if people want to, uh, want to have a look. All right, so I'll go now to, uh, to the four areas with some examples of reflective questions. Um, the first area is really about thinking about the status quo in relation to power and, and, and privilege. And I saw in the, in the first waterfall chat that we did that people are um, aware that there are inequalities. Not everyone is, is um, participating to the same amount, but um, we, we want to offer opportunities for engagement to everyone. And there's some people also aware that they come from more privileged backgrounds. And that was certainly the case in the context we've been working in, in the informal science learning, where people who tend to be involved, as well as the researchers, you know, tend to come from more privileged backgrounds. So how, how do we make sure we are being equitable and, and support people who may be from minoritized uh, communities or, or less privileged backgrounds? Uh, so looking at transforming power relations, we'd be asking questions around who and what counts as, um, say, as valuable knowledge. Uh, what are some dominant ways of working in your, in your practice? And might they be ex excluding um, some of the people? In thinking about who is being prioritized, it's useful thinking about whose agenda drives the work that, that you do um, it might be particular funder requirements, or it might be driven by wanting to make a difference um, in terms of social justice or the environment, or maybe you want to support scientific literacy or get more young people to go into a particular career. And, and there are sometimes tensions between those different agendas. So it's worth thinking, what does that mean for the work that, that you do in terms of equity? The third one uh, here is redistributing resources. So it's really thinking about who we're reaching and engaging with and, and whether attention is given to how we're supporting people from less privileged uh, communities to, to engage with the, with the opportunities. The next area is working with and valuing minoritized communities. Um, and the first, uh, dimension focuses on participatory working. So we'd be thinking about, are we working with the people, with the participants, rather than delivering content to them? Do people have any say in what we do, how we do things, the topics we focus on? Um, do we consider their, their interests and, and, and needs in, in, in what we do? And participatory working is something that has been um, it's been increasingly practiced by different organizations and there's been different ways from consultations to setting up uh, youth boards, um, which if, if anyone's more interested in, we got resources for as well, because the organizations that we, uh, we work with on this project um, set up um, youth boards. So we got some tips and, and case studies of how, how that was um, being care carried out. And then um, when we're thinking about the asset based approach, we really want to focus on uh, what experiences, knowledge, skills we're considering valuable and um, whether we are including, you know, different cultural and experiential knowledge as, as something that's being recognized and, and valued. So it's really about taking a perspective of um, focusing on what people have and can offer rather than viewing them through a deficit view thinking, you know, we got to increase interest, increase knowledge, we got to make sure that young, young, old people, whoever you're working with, have the right attitudes, the right skills, the right, like, they, they need changing in some 
um, shape or form. The next area, um, embedding equity, I think that one is really key um, because what it brings attention to is that equity really needs to be mainstream throughout the organization. Um, and quite often um, that is an individual or a group of people or a specific project that is committed to equity, but the rest of the practice goes as, as it's always been and it's not necessarily mainstream, which, which really limits the, the potential of, of, equitable, um, of equitable work. So um, a point would be from an equity perspective, it's really worth worth thinking how, how central major and intentional equity issues are in, in the work that, that you do. And then finally, to maximize the potential of equitable practice, it's worthwhile thinking of how um, equity can be um, extended. Uh, thinking about long-term, even if you might say be delivering a one-off session, um, a talk, a science festival, um, how can you bridge that or connect with other experiences so that people have something to go on to? And then how you might be able to support not just individual outcomes, but wider outcomes for, for the society and kind of have a more collective orientation. It was quite quick, but as I, as I said, I wanted to give you a bit of a flavor and have enough time to uh, answer some questions and have some reflections of what this might mean for your own, own work. Um, and there's lots of resources available. Um, I think Jen can pop in a link to this in the, in the chat. We, um, we wanted to share one of the short films hang on, hang on. <laughs> uh, from, from the project um, where, um, Bo, who was head of education at Hanwell Zoo, uh, talks about how they use the equity compass to plan, um, evaluate, and develop their conservation education programs there. Um, so it might be particularly relevant to some people in the audience um, if you are in that sector. We also um, have an adaptation that we wrote for uh, Ruth about how botanic gardens may, may be able to think using the compass and think about equity in their, in their work. Uh, so that might be another one that's um, of interest to, to some of the, the people. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll share those links. Yeah, just briefly spell it. Is the Botanic Garden link, um, is that one accessible from like the yesstem.org website or? It, it's, on the, it's on the website. OK. Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. that. Stella obviously was actually on that project, and I was more affiliated and supporting and dropping in. So, <laughs> and I'm, we're part of the same research group, so that's why I'm not quite as familiar with the website as Stella. All right, over to you, right. Great. So, so thanks so much. Um, what I'm really and I'm still off mute. Okay, good. Um, these are just sort of in thinking about kind of the impact, or I'm not even sure if, I suppose impact is the right word. We often think of impact as something on others, on the audience and that sort of thing, but thinking about impact kind of on the practitioners who kind of have embarked on this journey. And in this case, these were, I, I think, spell all part of the YesTem project. Um, but really one of the themes that comes up a lot in thinking about the impact of embarking on this work, doing this work, engaging um, with the compass, and trying to shift practice, one thing that comes up a lot are these feelings of discomfort or feeling a bit uncomfortable around this. And, and it's certainly, um, I don't know if issue is the right word, it's certainly something that does happen. And I think that not just in the Yestin project, but in this kind of work more broadly, you see it a lot. And I think one of the great things about the equity compass um, is that it really, acknowledges that this work is difficult it is messy and I think as a field this is something that we're we are getting to grips with that it's not straightforward but also importantly that feeling uncomfortable can really be a good kind of impetus for change and for moving and how you kind of 
and and the equity compass really gives you a way or gives us all a way to start to shift our practice to sort of set to to do something with that discomfort. Part of it is kind of sitting with it and saying, okay, it's okay, and it's to be expected that it's going to be difficult, messy, and uncomfortable work in many ways. But here are some ways to move forward that that while on some aspects you might be earlier in your practice or at earlier stages and thinking of that that kind of um, the the poll from earlier, but then in other dimensions you might be further along and it kind of emphasizes that it is a journey, but and 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 it's probably one that never really is complete, so to speak. And I was quite pleased to see that no one rated themselves a ten because um, that was a bit of a if red herring is the right word, but that, that we're never fully going to get there, but we can always keep moving. We can always keep improving. And I think that that um, it really helps to kind of stop as, as one of the, the people in the quote who's quote who is quoted there is that, you know, it can be helpful to kind of stop and reflect and think and see what you can do with that um, discomfort. So um, Spella, I'm going to hand back off to you to sort of help guide us through thinking a little bit more of about what our next steps might be. So we've we've introduced, or Spell has introduced the compass. We've kind of talked about some of how this might pan out for you, but if you want Spella to, to kind of move to the next slide and, and introduce a couple further questions for reflection. Oh, I think there was plenty of us um, talking about the compass. So we want to again pause and, and just take a couple of uh, minutes um, and ask you to think about your equitable practice um, and think about um, what might be one thing you might like to try in order to move your practice in a more equitable direction. Um, and you can think, you know, if, if there was no limits, what's one thing you would want to do um, differently, perhaps. Um, and then the second question uh, we wanted to prompt you thinking about what needs to happen in your organization to support equitable practice. As we say, like it's something that is, it's quite tricky to do on your own. So often there needs to be an, an organizational support and commitment to equity. So if you've got any specific thoughts on what in your specific uh, situation may help, we'd love to share. So I think we'll pause here for maybe four minutes um, and, have a think and if you're comfortable sharing a quick reflection put a number to which question you are responding to and and, and we can have a bit of a look what what people have, have have shared in a couple of minutes I really like Penny's comment, and I just will say that yes, we are aware that we've put a time limit on a question in this session. We haven't given you very, very much time. We are, we are aware of that. We're trying to squeeze a lot into forty-five minutes, but in general, it's, it's a, that's a really, it's a really great point.
I'll leave us one more minute or so, and then maybe we can pick out a couple of um, points. Also, if anyone is thinking of any specific questions about what we covered, um, do feel free to pop them in the in the Q and A, and we can come back to to these in the last couple of minutes. Yes, and we can also. What I found out, or my understanding anyway, is that if you pop them in the Q and A, they they don't necessarily get saved. Whereas if you put them in the chat, then the chat gets saved. <laughs> so. Um, But yeah, we're at about four minutes, so yeah, to kick things yeah, off. I'll start by I have lots of thoughts as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been jaw, jaw, jotting down some, some ideas. I think you've, you've been highlighting how important it is that you know it's everyone's priority. It's it's really it is difficult to do those things if everybody's feeling stressed and if committed and passionate individuals kind of do it within their roles, but are not given time and, and, and space to engage with equity when equity is an add-on if we can do it. So um, it definitely helps if the, if the leadership, the management is um, embedding that within, within the organization and prioritizing things like training um, staff around this equity issue. I think someone men mentioned, um, you know, just just the value of like um, training and, and and development and to engage with these issues which can be difficult and and, and sensitive and they don't come naturally um, to know kind of how best how best to do them and there are also a few other really interesting points around oh I was just gonna build on that real quick what before you move on to the next um, theme spell if it's okay about this point about, you know, it, things coming from the leadership. And I know one of the issues around it also is it'll be written in somewhere, but then there's nothing that really follows up on it. But I think your point about training is really good. Um, if they sort of establish that as part of a training, another thing that I've seen um, is when it becomes part of kind of the um, almost uh, staff development, staff assessment train, you know, framework. So if this is something that people are actually held accountable for in their performance reviews and things like that, that that's a, a section. I mean, that doesn't then make it easier, but that formalizes it in a way. And I've seen this in some other, um, in some science centers that I've worked with where it's actually become a, a formal thing. And you could say, oh, well, then that's just a box they have to tick, but at least it's there. And I think that that's all, that also helps really make it more, um, make it concrete in a particular way. Thanks, Jen. Um... The second point I wanted to pull out, uh, quite a few people writing about more participatory working and co-designing, working with, with people. Um, and some of you highlighted that quite often we sort of, we, we listen, but we don't act. And, and this work can sometimes be a bit tokenistic. It is, it can become a tick box exercise. We consulted a local group, um, but what are we doing with these? So questions around, um, accountability to to these people and power sharing how much are you really involving them in in, in a meaningful way are, are really important because even even something like a youth board can be done from a very equitable perspective or it can be a much more tokenistic kind of one way it looks good but it's not actually meaningful and it can be a bit extractive and those people have limited power so there's still sort of a scale of of some of those things um and i'll get it to the next point it's sometimes not as much what you do but how and why you are doing a particular thing and and i'll just pick up on one point and then pass on to jen because I'm, I'm sure has, has thoughts as well the point around funding that absolutely we are often um guided or or our work is structured around what the funding requirements are and and if there was more attention to equity and inclusion then that would facilitate and encourage perhaps more 
um, more more focus on on that in in the programs. And we have indeed um, been working with uh, we're working with UKRI and British Science Association, who uh, were looking at the compass to think about how how they might approach um, developing new strategies and new funding calls to think about equity um, and support both both how they themselves could um, develop more equitable practice and how they can support more equitable practice in the projects and programs that they fund but they they have a lot of power to make a change absolutely Jen did you want to um, add anything any thoughts yeah, I mean, it's just really kind of building on what you were saying, and 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 as well in terms of um, the the perpetual themes in the um, in the chat around, you know, finding time and resource, you know, and and basically time and money, both resources really, and your point about the funding and how so much of it is short term funding and and the messages that that sends, and as well as kind of if it's not a part of the core funding, then it makes it incredibly hard to do this kind of work, um, which is hard enough in and of itself. But an another thing that that I've seen um, recently is it does seem, and I'm probably naive, but um, it does seem that funders, at least some funders are moving towards what I call a more enlightened model and sort of realizing that this work does take time. It does need to be funded. The community organizations that you might be working with need to be funding, funded. There needs to be staff time. It's not just about maybe some kit or, you know, oh, we'll fund the development of these three sessions and you'll go and deliver them or whatever it is. Um, and so I'm hopeful that, for example, with UKRI's new um, strategy and some of the new programs that they've got going on and things that are in development, hopefully that will, there's certainly people within UKRI who um, are, you know, have, have sort of believed very strongly in this. And so hopefully there will be some shifts there. And I've seen this um, also in the US as, as the direction that you have some, some of these core funders go in, it really puts a stake in the ground. And um, there are many, many problems with the US as we know, but some of the funding landscape is really moving towards properly funding this way of work and and without necessarily this increasing the size of the pot but how it's directed so that this sort of thing is allowed rather or is supported and encouraged and over the long term rather than in these very short um short kind of bursts um the other thing i was going to say is and it also speaks to timelines and and not sort of oh we have to consult with someone at the last minute but really as projects are developed in the first place and even put forward for funding that it allows these really long timelines that are funded, you know, they're the staff time anyways funded. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to take, I mean, it, it is a bit of quantity, but sort of quality in the sense of sometimes it, it, it may take a year and a half to develop, but it's not a full-time role for a year and a half necessarily. It may be something that's just dropped in. And so you don't have that pressure. We have to develop this and think this up and, and do this right away. But um, so I think how that timeline develops can also be really critical. Um, and yeah, so that's that's what I would sort of add. But I, I think they're fantastic comments in the in the chat and it completely echoes with what we've been hearing in lots of different sectors. And it really does seem to be this this trajectory that the field seems to be on, which hopefully we'll be able to um, continue. And I think the, the compass is a really good um, tool to help us along along that journey. I'll hand back to you, Spella. Well, yeah, before I move, just have like a few um, concluding thoughts on the next slide. But um, another point that was raised, and it's so important, is around learning from from um, each other, learning from different organizations within and across the sector. Um, one of the things that um, was really valuable, I know, to all our um, partner organizations was just to have space and opportunity to um, interact, engage with one another. And, you know, it was maybe like a community center with a zoo, with a science center, people that don't necessarily have kind of an umbrella organization where they would meet. But a lot of the issues around wanting to be more equitable and inclusive are really similar. And there's a lot that, um, 
we can learn from each other. There is a lot of very strong practice out there that can be adopted from one um, context to, to another. Um, and I'll move us on to our final few um, slides before we start wrapping up to make sure we uh, we're done in time. Oh, can I just add quickly add add on to that because when I've seen in projects where there has been this learning from different organizations, and I think one of the barriers to this sort of work is is partly you know it's time and resource, but also it's the unknown of how much time and resource might that take, and that's a very kind of concrete way. Yes, every situation is different, but there are certain projects that that some organizations have found it very helpful in advocating to say senior management that oh well this is how much time this is how much we need to ask for and and that can help it can also be daunting but it can at least give you something to concrete to kind of focus thank you so i i just wanted to finish with a few um concluding points um it is important to intentionally foreground um, equity and social justice. If we don't, we risk reproducing the status quo, which we know um, tends to exclude some people from, from engaging and, and, and participating in, in the activities, whether that's science education, formal science learning, um, public engagement, engaging with the issues around climate change and, and so on. And as I mentioned before, it, it's often not what you do. It's not necessarily the type of program, but how and why you do it, the values um, and the approaches that underpin um, the work that you do. But also um, small changes make a difference and, and we should be celebrating small successes. There's, there is always more that you can do, but even just identifying what you already do well and see how that can be shared and perhaps um, tested and tried in another context is, is really valuable. Um, as Jan was saying earlier, often in this sort of work and in kind of longer trainings that we run around um, equitable practice and using the equity compass, um, this comfort is part of it, especially when, you know, we start challenging practice um, that is often um, led by people from more privileged communities and, and kind of challenging something that's been done for 10 years, 20 years, and it's like, oh, but it's what? And kind of trying to think about like, but it's working for some people, but maybe not for others. And, and we have to think about power and privilege, which, which can sometimes be um, um, challenging for, for some people, but discomfort is a welcome sign that you're on the right track. Um, and, and finally, as we were saying, this is this is a journey. It's not a big box exercise. You 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 get to and you finish. You know there are programs change, audiences may may change. So it's something that's worthwhile kind of keep keep thinking about um, and and developing. Uh, but um, um, and just finally, as I, as I was saying, we we do have lots of resources we got a series of these short insights for um teachers funders um one we did with stem ambassadors uh, so the examples that we use are quite specific then to to those people because we got a few colleagues involved who work in different sectors to help us write these um and and we'll share a link to um a free online course um that people can take that goes into a bit more depth of, of, of the equity compass and how it may be useful in, in different contexts and for different purposes. Uh, I think we're right on time. So I will um, stop the share and, and I hope this was useful and it gives you some ideas and um, if it's something that resonates, feel free to reach out, get in touch um, or, see, or see our other, our other things that are available. Yeah, and the the link to the oh, um, course I am posting the be, yes, I got it here. Great. Okay. Yeah, I was just looking for that, and it's it it also would be linkable. I'm almost positive from the the yesstem.org uh, website. So yeah, I post here, and I'm told that the chat will be shared with participants afterwards. So if you don't manage to click on the link now, that will be available. But everything is on yesstem.org website. Thank you, Sue.
All right, I think it's my time to wrap up. Thank you so much again for, for joining the session and I hope um, you'll enjoy the rest of the conference.